So let's start this lecture by defining what I mean with these terms cognitive and with the microelectronics part. And with the microelectronics, I mean integrated circuits. Integrated circuit design meaning amplifiers, mixers, oscillators. So it has nothing to do with uh, trying to fabricate some uh, material. It's rather to build up functions on top of the integrated circuit. And as the previous lectures, I will also go back in the history, but I will go only back to the 1958, when the first integrated circuit was developed at TI Labs by, by Jack Kilby. Now, a few years after that, a researcher called Gordon Moore made a famous prediction that when he looked at the data so far, he noticed that the number of transistors that you can put on one IC doubles roughly in each two years. So in this slide, or in this graph, you see his, his prediction, and also it includes the actual implementations that have been done throughout the history. So from there, you can see that it's quite amazing how good this prediction has been. And, and now if we look at today on single IC, we can produce billions of transistors. So those are quite sort of complex systems that you can currently put on top of the IC. There are basically two phenomena behind this. One of those is that you are able to fabricate larger and larger dyes, but the more important feature is that the size or the minimum feature size of the devices is decreasing. Nowadays, the modern technologies which, for instance, we are using are somewhere down to 32 nanometers length. Obviously, those of you who know the physics know that this development cannot go forever. One day it will end. There has been predictions that this slope will decrease to three, that it doubles in every three years in, in next few years, but there are still technology nodes that are coming. Uh, another way of looking at this thing is that if we look at traditional electronics, you see that in addition of transistors, there are a lot of passive components included in the, in the electronic devices. And here you can see, for example, an exa a photograph of on-chip inductor. A typical size of this device is something like 400 microns by 400 microns. And really the value of this inductor depends on the length of the wire and you need to have a certain width with that wire in order to reduce its losses. Now, if we compare that to a, a, a microcontroller, a simple microcontroller, including 250,000 transistors with a technology that was used for, let's say, five years ago, this microcontroller took something like a square millimeter. Now, if we go to modern technologies, the size of the same microcontroller is less than the size of this inductor. So you can immediately make a, a notification that, okay, you want to use a structure that doesn't use passive components. It's not that easy in all the designs. Some designs rely heavily on these passive components, so it's, it's rather tricky to, go, uh, to replace these passive components. Fortunately, there is one thing that plays a role also in the design, is that once you scale down the, the minimum feature size, everything gets faster. So nowadays, our analog or RF designs can work up to several hundred gigahertz in pure CMOS uh, 
technologies. Pure digital designs operate in the region of few gigahertzes and these mixed mode designs which are partly analog, partly digital work in the area of the spectrum where for instance most of our wireless devices are operating. Now, by saying that, we can say now that the price and size of a single logic gate is extremely cheap. So it means that we can quite easily include uh, digital engines on chip. So for instance, we can put cognitive features on the microelectronics that we are designing. For instance, it cannot be a cognitive digital processor. For instance, we are trying, we can share the load in the processor depending where it's needed. It can, for instance, observe which blocks of, for instance, some processor are not operating as they are supposed to do. For instance, typically part of the memory that you have in your device is, is faulty. So it can observe this and it can also adapt to the behavior of the user. It can be a cognitive sensor, basically a sensor, an, an integrated electronics that adapts to the sensor element, it adapts to its uh, environment, or it can adapt to the user behavior. For instance, it can be powered down when the data is not, not needed. Or perhaps most well-known uh, uh, application for this cognitive microelectronics is, is currently the cognitive radios. So this is basically partly the same thing what Riku said, so it, it makes an observation on the, on the free spectrum one way or the other and then adapts its, its operation. So if we look at the most reliable source uh, where what we can find, this is something what it says. It says that the cognitive radio is a radio that does some sort of uh, uh, active monitoring on its environment. It can be active monitoring on this, for instance, on the available spectrum. And then it changes its parameters accordingly. For a researcher, all of this sounds sort of an interesting topic which you would like to resolve and on which you would like to work on. However, let's think a while that do we really need these cognitive radios in, in our future? And let's look at it from an other perspective. For instance, in this slide, it's shown how the data that is transmitted throughout the wireless devices is, is increasing. So for a few years ago, it was already observed that the packet data that you put through the wireless devices has exceeded the data that is put through the voice calls. Now, uh, and the, also an important factor is that it's, it's increasing heavily. Uh, if we go back 15 years ago, the only mobile or cellular system which we had was a, was a GSM system which had 40 megahertz of spectrum available for that system. So everybody of you can imagine that, well, there is only certain amount of bits that you can push through this uh, spectrum. So how the industry has reacted on this demand? They have reacted in a way that, well, they have increased the number of bands which are allocated for cellular usage. If you look at the latest standards, there are more than 30 bands allocated for the, for the cellular usage. And already this poses huge challenges on the integrated circuit design because this band, it's not just one wide band at some part of the spectrum. The spectrum is, is scattered as a bits and pieces here and there. So your radio 
needs to be able to tune all of these bands and it need to be able to receive simultaneously data from several of these bands. Now, it easily leads to the, to the parallel hardware and, and parallel hardware always means, at least it means that, that the size of your chip is increasing, but it easily leads to the fact that your power is increasing and, and, and everything else is becoming more complex. Obviously the IC or the integrated circuit is, is, is part of it, but uh, if you for instance think about the antennas, there are several bands, you need several antennas. The antennas are huge in current, well they are not that huge, but anyways, if you put several of those within the device, uh, it creates a challenge how to put those all in a place that they can have a decent reception and how you can make, for instance, the physical routing from antenna to the integrated circuit itself. Now if you look at the future, I would say that cognitive radio, a radio that really tries to use the spectrum wherever it's available, somehow will start to pay, play a role, but how it, what kind of cognitive radio will it be, that's not for sure. But if we then look at some things that we have implemented and how we have tried to, to tackle on these issues. The first example is, is a receiver that is now meant for wideband reception. So basically, the signal coming to the RF input can be anything between 2 and 6 gigahertz. Uh, if you look at this uh, or the wideband radios, there's wideband radios have existed years and years, but what we did in this, this chip is that we added a feedback loop that is frequency dependent. So it means that it can filter out the signals outside the band that we are not monitoring. It's not a, well at this stage it's not a perfect solution but it helps. Because the problem is in, in very wide band receivers for instance that when the spectrum, large part of the spectrum is coming uh, on the input of your device, the powers of those signals can be very different. For instance, there can be other mobile device quite close to your radio, there can be a base station very far which you are trying to receive, so you, it easily leads to a situation where the whole reception is corrupted. So this, this thing really helps to tackle on those issues. And obviously if we think about future, one of the sort of optimal, one of the problems which we need to optimize is this I.O. here and, and we are trying to solve some of the issues related to that and, and related to antennas in cooperation with the, with the radio department. So this is one of the examples of more or less uh, analog and RF designs. It includes something like uh, few hundred transistors. The next one here, which is a synthesizer, is designed uh, using a bit different approach. It's, I would say that this is more or less this mixed mode type of, of ICs. So synthesizer is basically a device that produces a tone. The, this, these tones are, well, they can be as a, used as a clock signal for the processor or they can be as a LO signal for the mixers which do the, do the down conversion. Now, the optimal feature for this kind of synthesizers would be that it would, well, cover an octave tuning range, really huge tuning range on which you could uh, tune this, this frequency and obviously it would meet the other requirements that are now set for this type of, of devices. And obviously in the future you would like that it, it would give also several tones at the, at the output. This specific design includes a few thousand 
custom designed uh, transistors. But the sort of the interesting thing in this device is that if you look at traditional synthesizers, they all include a global feedback loop. And always when you include a global feedback loop, you include some sort of a slowness in the, in the circuit. So if you use it basically doing feed forward type of, of, of designs, you can come up with uh, circuits that, for instance, settle quite instantly. So the settling time, for instance, with these devices is something like a few nanoseconds. Uh, and then a third example of these devices is the implementation of these sensing algorithms on, on which Riku was talking about. So Basically, we are not uh, the researchers who are inventing algorithms. So we are cooperating with academy professor Koivunen, who is from signal processing and who well, optimizes and tries to re does a research on the algorithms. So if you wonder what's then our job, if, if you have an algorithm, what do we do with the algorithm then? So our uh, thing that we do is that we actually put those designs within uh, those algorithms within the mobile devices themselves. The algorithms that have been produced, for, for instance, by Professor Koivun, and they are optimal, but they are not optimized for wireless implementation. So we make a little violence to those uh, algorithms and we simplify them a bit so that they can be put energy efficiently, for instance, on these uh, radios. For example, one version of, of this board has been uh, put on an actual mobile phone where the guys who, who we are doing the collaboration can do measurements uh, out in the open space. Okay, so if you ask me where we are in the cognitive radio evolution, I would show something like this. I could say that, that we are starting the, the evolution, but the device itself is not, not very smart yet. And I would say that what we have seen so far is, is just the beginning of this evolution, and we don't know what it will look in the, in the far future. So then going back to the thing that I started on, uh, the first ICs were done in, in, in 58. And now, the, as said, the evolution will end at some day. So there was also a talk today about graphene. So our motivation in graphene is not to develop the material itself. Our motivation is to get the devices when they can be reliably produced. We are not trying to affect on the molecules. We are again trying to build up some functions on, for instance, graphene devices. On that we have been, for instance, cooperating with, uh, with, the, pre, with the Micronova uh, who have been fabricating our, us these devices, and we can see that, well, at least some of those work as, as a transistors. So this is basically what's there, what are the research challenges for me, but, but I would say that for next years, the biggest challenge in the daily work is how to graduate these guys as a doctors. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. <laughs>